Good morning. My name is Lucas and I am part of the team here at Fort City. 
A lot of work goes into producing these services. There's prayer, planning, video production, and more prayer. And we do this all because we think the story of Jesus is the most important story ever told, and we want everyone to hear it. You being here this morning to worship and pray with us makes it all worth it. If you're out there in the series of connected tubes that is the interwebs, make sure to say hi in the comments. You can ask questions, share prayer requests, and just show up in the comments. I met my wife, Adrian in the summer before grade 10. And the first time I met her was at a youth group event held by the church over in Birchwood Trails. Adrian and her family were new to town and the Esau's invited them to the youth group. So I guess I should be thanking Murray and Marianne Esau for the wonderful life I have now. And that fall, Adrian and I started to do the whole high school crush thing. And we had a couple of classes together where she would pretend to need my help and I would pretend to know what I was talking about. And then we'd get home from school and chat all night on MSN Messenger. You millennials know what I'm talking about. I was seriously crushing on her, but I was too afraid to make the first move. I knew I liked her, but I was too scared to ask her to be my girlfriend. Adrian is a strong, capable woman, and she was the same back then. And she got tired of waiting on me, and so she took things into her own hands. Another guy at school had been asking her for a while to go to a movie with him. And he worked at the movie theater, so it was free and the snacks were included. And she kept saying no until she said yes. The next day she told me all about this date and she went, they all, she went on all about this guy. And let's just say it lit a fire under me and shortly after that I got the courage to ask her to be my girlfriend. Adrian knew exactly what she was doing. She didn't want to force me to do anything, but she did want to help me see what I probably should be doing. This is often how God works with us. He wants us to follow him. He wants us to give our lives to him. He wants us to make the choice to turn towards him and the life that he wants for us. He doesn't want to force us. So along the way, he does things to help draw us in. He, he gives us problems we can't solve on our own, a feeling that won't go away, and people who inspire us. He draws us to himself, but we have to make a choice to take that step and to follow him. This morning, we've been praying that God would use this moment to inspire you to make a decision, the decision to follow Jesus in the act of baptism. Later on in the service, we have a child dedication happening. And it's when a, a parent's decision to dedicate their child to God and they commit to raising them with faith in their life. It's a parent's choice and a parent's blessing. But baptism is different. Only you can choose to be baptized. This morning, if you've decided to follow Jesus, then it's time to decide to get baptized. If you're feeling that small, quiet voice in you saying, maybe it's time, that just could be the Holy Spirit doing what he does best. If you are interested in baptism or just wanna talk about it with me, uh, there's a link in the chat right now where you can request that. Fill out that form and I'll get back to you. Okay guys, that's it from me. Let's spend some time in worship together. Trust 
This morning, I, we get to do something very special, something that we love doing here at church, is we get to dedicate a little child to God. And one of, it's one of the special things that we get to do uh, that we love doing around here. It's when parents decide that they want to commit to raising their child with faith in their lives. It's parents dedicating to God uh, their children and teaching them the ways of Jesus. Our kids are incredibly important and child dedication is just one of the ways that we get to show that. Now I got to be on the stage a few years ago with you too when we dedicated your first child, Kaysen, and it is a privilege that I get to be here and dedicate Camry with you as well. So thank you guys for inviting me to be part of this. Uh, there is an amazing moment in the life of Jesus when he showed us just how important children are to him. And I'm going to read it. It's from Mark 10. And it says, People were bringing little children to Jesus for him to place his hands on them. But the disciples rebuked them. And when Jesus saw this, he was indignant. And he said to them, Let the little children come to me, and do not hinder them. For the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Truly, I tell you, when Jesus says truly, he means it's important. And truly, I tell you, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. And he took the children in his arms and he placed his hands on them and he blessed them. And that's what we're going to do today. We're going to bless Camry. Our kids are important to God. This little girl is so very precious and treasured to Jesus. And so I'm going to say a few uh, parts of the dedication, and then at the end, it's just, you just need to acknowledge that, yes, you agree. All right? So, believing that and knowing that God has made you accountable for her, do you confess that it is your purpose to dedicate Camry to the Lord and to his service? Will you pray with her and for her? Will you instruct her faithfully in the way of Jesus, teach her to read the word of God, to pray and to lead a holy life, and do all that is in your power to bring her to the knowledge of Jesus Christ as her Savior and Lord? Awesome. You know, we know the saying, it takes a village to raise a child. And you guys are lucky to have an incredible village surrounding you. Uh, some of them are actually in the room with us today. They're an incredible blessing to you. And so for everybody here today and everybody who is watching online, uh, just as an act of commitment to this family, we're going to pray together uh, and dedicate this little girl to God. So let's do that now. Let's pray. <clears throat> Jesus, we just take a moment to thank you for this beautiful, precious life that you've created. And we thank you that you have given her an incredible future that lays ahead of her. And Jesus, we pray for Camry that she would come to know you at an early age, that she would grow into a, a powerful and strong and capable woman of faith. Jesus, I thank you for her parents and the decision they've made today to dedicate her. And I pray that you give them wisdom and, and lead them as they continue to be incredible parents to this little girl. Jesus, we thank you for the blessing of Camry, and we just pray a blessed life for her. In your holiest of names, amen. You guys, thanks for letting us do this today. It's really been awesome. A good morning, or whenever you happen to be watching this. Well, while no government uh, decision is without controversy these days, this week our Premier Jason Kenney outlined a reopening plan that would allow us at Fort City to go to in-person services starting on June 13th at one-third capacity. That's in two short weeks if everything goes as planned. We'll have a sign-up system for those two Sundays, but yeah, I'm really excited about us getting to back together in in-person services. Then, if things continue to go according to the Kenny plan, the restrictions will be mostly removed for Sunday, July 4th, as we enter into what everyone is calling like the new normal. Friends, we will not have had full freedom to meet for 15 months. That's well over a year. I'm pumped that we'll be able to move back into in-person services without restrictions. That's hopefully July 4th at 10 a.m. And hey, you'll still be able to catch us online. I, I think, yeah, we, we had like three families watching us from Gregoire Lake last Sunday. How cool is that? You'll still be able to do that wherever you are. Now today in my message, I'll be talking about prayer and spiritual warfare. And let me tell you that Evil One has been very much at work over the past 15 months as many believers have drifted further and further away from being connected to a church family and from God himself. All across our country, people are exhausted, confused, angry, and increasingly distant from God. 
The evil one has been at work wanting to weaken uh, the church, but our God is greater. And here's what grips me. People in our city have uh, just gone through 15 months where the world has gone crazy and they've, they've lost control of their lives. And friends, they are open to a love that is supernatural, healing, restoring, full of freedom. Many don't realize that the love they're looking for is found in Jesus, that the restoration, healing, and freedom they seek comes from Jesus. But they are open, far more open than they have been for a long time. So we in the church, yeah, we're a little bit exhausted at a time when people in our city are hungry for a supernatural touch of some sort to experience that love of another kind. So all of us, we, we, we need a fresh touch from God to help us transition well into this new normal so that we can be a part of what God is up to in the lives of so many of our friends who do not yet know Jesus. So two things I would like to ask of you as we move into this new normal. Will you pray? Pray like you've never prayed before for yourself and your family, but yeah, for the mission of your church, that we would make Jesus visible in this city, that, that lives all over our city would experience the love of Jesus in a life-transforming way. Pray with passion. Pray with conviction. Pray for your church. And at the same time, would you commit to giving? To giving sacrificially so that we can seize this moment with strength to help not only you and your family get back on track, but to see more and more people touched and healed by Jesus. Your giving will see lives change. Your giving will make a huge difference. So please give and please consider automating your giving and keep praying that God will bless us and empower us to be a huge blessing to our city. Will you join me in prayer as I pray for all this? Father God, Thank you that we get to be the church for such a time as this. And I just pray that you would pour out your spirit on the people of Fort City, touching us and healing us at our point of need so that we can be healthy and strong and be people who make Jesus visible to our city. Use us powerfully to be a source of healing and wholeness to all who need a touch from Jesus. And I pray for the finances that are needed to keep us strong and doing the work that you've called us to do. Lord, it's been a ride, but you've been faithful, but still, it's still, it's been a bumpy ride. Would you move each of us to give, to bring you glory as lives, not only in this church family, but throughout our city are touched and changed for the better, like right now and forever. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We battle against the world, the flesh, in unseen forces, in dark places. Therefore, train yourself to be godly. Guard your heart. Prepare your minds for action. Take every thought captive. Resist the devil. Demolish strongholds. Stand firm. Persist in prayer. Fight the good fight. Uh, today, as we uh, wrap up our message series, Amen, where we've been asking Jesus to teach us to pray just as his disciples asked him, this week, our focus is on that part of the Lord's Prayer that says, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Jesus himself and the writers of the Bible would want us to know that there's a battle going on that's not always visible, that takes place in what can be best described as the unseen realm, that there is an evil one and a team of demonic beings out there that are powerfully at work in this world and even powerfully at work in your life, in my life, whether we're aware of that work or not. So, okay, what do you think? Is it crazy to believe that Satan and his demonic beings are alive and at work in this world today? Or is that just a, a bunch of hysterical myths that some antiquated church people believe? Before you're too quick to answer, let me ask, has there ever been a time in world history where evil doesn't rear its ugly head in very dark, unimaginable ways? Has there ever been a time when people have not been caught up with some really dark, immoral behavior and life-destroying addictions? 
I mean, what really is behind the death of George Floyd and the ongoing entrenched racism that can be found in every part of the world, including our own city? Or, or what about the mess that we see right now in the Middle East? And, and why do people in the West so quickly take sides with one side or the other? Are, are not both sides gripped by the influence of the evil one, making truth and justice so hard to find? The Apostle John says, we know that we are God's children and that the whole world lies under the power of the evil one. We are God's children, but we live in a world where not one single part of this world escapes the influence and damaging power of the evil one. The whole world lies under the power of the evil one. The whole world, including your world and my world. Jesus, he made the same contrast about why he came to this world. He, he came to undo the work of the evil one. He came to push back on the rule of Satan. Jesus said the thief, talking about Satan, comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. We call it an unseen battle. But hey, we, we see the results of this battle everywhere. We see it in the homeless, the addicted, the abusive, the violent, the manipulative, the seducer, the fraudster, the unscrupulous. They are either victims of the evil one or instruments of the evil one. And, and while the evil one works in the unseen realms, it's not hard to see what he's doing. And Jesus came to undo the work of the evil one so that you and me can have that life and live it to the full. As for the unseen demonic side of all of this, let me tell you a story. A year and a half ago, uh, Jane and I went to Cuba on a missions tour with our church family, the Christian Missionary Alliance. It was not all that long ago that churches were totally banned in Cuba. There is now limited freedom for churches. And one of the churches we visited was uh, in a very poor, uh, uh, very uh, densely populated part of Camagüey, Cuba. Camagüey is in the central part of Cuba, about 550 kilometers southeast of Havana. It is the second or maybe third largest city in Cuba. The Alliance Church in Camagüey is just awesome. In the midst of poverty, including their own poverty, I mean, there is no affluence in this church. They still do so much. When the last hurricane came through that part of Cuba, they took it upon themselves to build homes on the property they own and, and to let families move into those homes uh, uh, rent-free. They are not a financially well-off people, but out of their own funds, they built homes for their neighbors who lost homes. Talk about making the invisible Jesus visible. Talk about living and loving like Jesus. Talk about pushing back on the destructive work of the evil one, pushing back on poverty. One building over and across the street from this church was a, a facility dedicated to the practice of what can be best described as a demonic faith that borrows enough from the Catholic faith to appear to be legitimate in, in Cuba. It's called Santeria. It's a combination of dark occultic practices that includes animal sacrifice and has as a central ritual a, a drumming, singing, dancing rite which encourages a, a spirit of the uh, orikas to possess you so that that spirit can speak to the people. This is big in many parts of Cuba. This temple across the street, which is really just a house, seem to be connected to the drug trade as well as maybe a prostitution ring, and people would be coming and going at all hours of the night. The neighborhood was just dark and unsafe in so many ways. So the Alliance Church in Camagüey decided to pray against this Santeria temple, that God in some way would just shut it down and you know, rid the neighborhood of such a demonic presence so that the streets would become safe again, so that the light of Jesus through the Alliance Church would shine brightly. It was less than a month, I think, before we arrived to visit this church when a fire with no known cause, a fire erupted in, in the interior of this temple that took out all of the worship areas and made the place uninhabitable for the priests and the priestesses who lived there. So that when Jane and I arrived, the place had only been recently abandoned. And there was an immediate change to the atmosphere of the neighborhood. But get this. Well, we had to stay quiet, and the church folk there had to stay quiet about the fact that this church had prayed against this temple. 
Because the power of prayer, whether Christian prayer or pagan prayer, it was seen as so powerful in that part of Cuba that the church could have been charged with arson because they prayed. Sounds a lot like what the Apostle Paul says. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. The writers of the Bible are very clear. We are in a spiritual battle. If you've been around Fort City for any length of time, you know that one of my heroes is St. Patrick of Ireland. I've done a couple of full messages on him, one of them on St. Patrick's Day in 2019, if you happen to want to hear more. Because, yeah, there is so much to love about this guy and how God used him to transform a nation so much. On a side note, if genetic research at a Trinity College in Dublin is correct, I am one of about three million guys of Irish descent who are genetically related to the high king of uh, Ireland known as Niall of the Nine Hostages. He he was responsible for conducting raids on Wales and Britain that saw uh, Patrick kidnapped as a youth. So I come, you know, maybe from the dark side, just, just saying, which I guess in a message on spiritual warfare maybe I shouldn't say, but... Those are my genes, and I have some Viking in me as well, so I have a lot of fighting Irish in me. Sometimes that's good, and sometimes that gets me in trouble. As a slave in Ireland, Patrick was in the middle of a country dominated by dark superstition and druid paganism where human sacrifice was considered normal, like acceptable. After escaping slavery... Uh, Patrick had a profound sense that God was calling him to go back to Ireland. He had these prophetic dreams that the people of Ireland were begging him to return and share the good news of Jesus with them. Just, Just powerful stuff. And so called of God, he went back to the land that he escaped from as a slave. And he would, I mean, he put himself in instant danger of death for escaping as a slave. But God used them powerfully to push back against the fear and the darkness that gripped Ireland so that by the time of his death, Patrick left behind a Christian nation. It's an incredible story. Friends, God used Patrick to undo the destructive work of the evil one. He got slavery eliminated in Ireland. Human sacrifice became unthinkable. And war between the various tribes was incredibly reduced. That's pushing back against the work of the evil one. That is spiritual warfare. So yeah, with Holy Spirit, empowered courage, Patrick stood up to the bloodthirsty kings who ruled the land. He worked hard, passionately preaching the message of Jesus while establishing churches and monasteries that that served the people, that just served them with love and compassion. God used them in a land that he describes as full of pagan barbarians, worshipers of idols and unclean things. And he saw the people of that land turn to Jesus in huge numbers. But you got to know, through it all, it was a deeply spiritual battle. Here's how Patrick uh, describes one particular night. He says, while I was asleep, Satan assailed me violently. A thing I shall remember as long as I shall be in this body. I believe that the key to Patrick's success, the the key to his authority and anointing as he pushed back on the dominant dark pagan practices of his day was because he learned how to pray. That rough time in his life when he served as a slave, as a shepherd boy in the hills of Ireland, he learned how to pray and to pray with passion. Let Let me quote Patrick again as he describes his prayer life as a slave. In a single day, I have said as many as a hundred prayers, and in the night, nearly the same, so that I remained in the woods and on the mountain, even before the dawn, I was roused to prayer, in snow, in ice, and rain, and and, and I felt no injury from it, nor was there any slothfulness in me as I see now, because the Spirit then was fervent in me. Friends, There is a strong relationship between ongoing, passionate, fervent, militant prayer and seeing the world around you change for the better. Prayer changes things for the better. Prayer pushes back on the work of the evil one and and changes our world for the better. Prayer is that powerful. I mean, 
The entire history of one nation was changed because of the prayer and the ministry of one man. At least he was the catalyst to a great movement of God. And friends, you could be that man, you could be that woman. Your, your prayer could push back on the work of the evil one in your home, in our city, in our country, in this world. Your prayer could be that powerful. I pray most days a, a portion of what's called uh, St. Patrick's Breastplate. It, it's a prayer attributed to Patrick for spiritual covering, a, a, a prayer for protection in the middle of spiritual attack. It's a long prayer, so I don't pray it all every day. And the part I want to quote for you right now, I don't pray very often, but this will give you a bit of Patrick's heart for prayer and for prayer as spiritual warfare. Here's how part of his prayer goes. I bind to me these holy powers. And he's talking about God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Against, against all Satan's spells and wiles, against the heart's idolatry, against the wizard's evil craft, against the death wound and the burning, the choking wave, the poison shaft, protect me, Christ, till thy returning. Ah, I bet you haven't prayed a prayer like that recently. But I tell you, the key to Patrick's success, which shaped the destiny of Ireland to this day, was the passion, the vibrancy, the militancy of his prayer life. And let me just... Take a moment to call you to prayer like that, for passionate, vibrant, militant prayer for the mission of our church, Fort City, for the sake of this amazing city of ours. A little earlier in the service, I talked about the reopening plan for Alberta that we got from our premier, Jason Kenney. And I asked you to pray for the mission of our church, and I asked you to give to the mission of our church. Because truth be told, like Patrick in Ireland, the church in Alberta is up against some strong spiritual opposition in many cases, I, yeah, just simply orchestrated by the evil one. And not just Fort City, but like churches all across our country are, are a bit weakened right now. We are a bit exhausted. Church leaders all across the country are exhausted. Some of you are feeling that exhaustion. And this is happening right at a time when people in our city and, a, and across the country are hungry for a supernatural touch of some sort, are hungry for love of another kind. And you can be assured that the evil one will be at work trying to keep the church down at a time of such opportunity. So would you pray? Pray not just for yourself and your family, but do pray for yourself and your family. But, but would you pray for your church? That God would turn up powerfully and give us the energy we need, the volunteers we need, the finances we need to seize this moment as we seek to make the invisible Jesus very visible in our city as we seek to live in love like Jesus. Would you push back against the work of the evil one and pray for a great outpouring of Jesus on our city that, that our church would be one of many churches who are able to receive all the people that God is calling to himself in these days of the new normal. Hey, I, I wish I had more time to tell you more stories of the life of Patrick. Man, he so inspires me as I seek to push back on the kingdom of Satan. Patrick's fervent, even militant prayer is the kind of prayer we need to see the victory we so yearn for where Jesus overcomes the darkness of this world. And yeah, all of this is true for you personally. More than you realize, you live in a world where the evil one and his demons are always at work and at work wherever you are. But there's good news. The good news is that you can overcome and bust through the work of the evil one. You can bust through what the evil one is doing in your family, among the people you work with in this city. How? James, the brother of Jesus, writes, submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Submit yourself to God. It all starts with a decision to surrender your life to Jesus, to give your life fully over to Jesus. I mean, no holding back. You know, the word submit, it's a strong word. But when you submit your life to Jesus, he, he fills you with his empowering Holy Spirit. He gives you the ability to resist and push back on the work of the evil one. When you submit yourself to God, you can take authority over the evil one and make him flee. We can, through Jesus, undo the destructive work of the evil one. Okay. The Apostle Peter writes, Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. 
Be alert and, and, and know that we do not have to be victims. Be alert and resist the devil and he will flee. Be alert and through prayer you undo the work of the evil one around you. And as you do, God uses you to change the circumstances you live in, to change life in your home, where you work, our church, our city. I'm talking powerful stuff. Holy Spirit stuff that powerfully changes lives for the better. But it starts with you submitting to God and being willing to step into the battle, into some spiritual war. The Apostle Paul has a, a well-known passage about all this. We've already touched on it a bit, but Paul writes, put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. Paul is telling us to stand our ground in this wild world we live in. Really what he's saying there is he's doing what James is doing, telling us to submit to God and resist the work of the devil. Take your stand against the devil's schemes, and when you do, he will fall. You know, in a world of collapsing morals, where trust in government is eroding at breakneck speed, where we're cynical about the major institutions that create stability in our society, where brutality and violence is yet again escalating, we need to see the schemes of the evil one behind all of this. We must see that part of what's going on in this crazy world of ours is because our world is under the power of the evil one. Friends, the devil and his cohorts are alive and well, and their destructive work is easy to see if you are willing to see. And so we're called to take our stand and resist. We are called to pray. We're called to look to Jesus and seek his mighty power to push back on the evil that is all around us. And our God has given us the ability, even the authority, to do just that. And hey, you resist the devil and you take a stand every time you share your faith in Jesus with someone who doesn't yet know him. Every time you invite someone to a church service or to watch online, sharing your faith is spiritually powerful. You resist the devil and you take a stand every time you forgive an enemy, stand up to a bully, care for the poor, create something beautiful, behave with honesty, promote racial justice as you push back on ethnic inequality. You resist the devil and you take your stand when you speak words of hope, when you refuse to gossip, when you choose to act with love and kindness, when you befriend someone who is different than you. You resist the devil and take your stand when you pray fervently, passionately, militantly for the work of God through your church and in our city. James, the brother of Jesus, says, submit yourselves then to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. And Jesus himself asks us to pray and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Let's pray and do both right now. Will you join me in prayer, our Father? Would you forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us? Would you lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil? And we, your children, humbly submit our lives to your leadership, to your lordship, and we pray, God, give us a fresh filling of your empowering Holy Spirit. And then with your spirit filling us to overflowing, would you use us to stand strong, to resist the devil and push back on his evil work in our lives and in this world? Would you empower us to live and love like you in the midst of a world that is under the power of the evil one? And as we live for you, may your kingdom come, may your will be done through us as it is in heaven. We pray all this in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. Mountains are still being moved. The strongholds are still being loose. God, we believe it. Yes, we can see that wonders are still what you do. And bodies are still being raised. And giants are still being slain. And God, we believe. Yes, we can see that wonders are still what you do. We are here.
you move. Healing is coming in this room. Miracles happen when you move. Heaven is coming. Miracles happen. We have a prayer team who would love to stand with you as you resist the devil and push back on the work of the evil one in your life or in the life of someone that you know. Just message us and they counted a privilege, a real privilege to pray for you and undo the work of the evil one with you. Now in closing, let me leave you with these words of St. Patrick from St. Patrick's Breastplate as he puts on the full armor of God for himself. I bind myself today the power of God to hold and lead, his eye to watch, his might to stay, his ear to hearken to my need, the wisdom of my God to teach, his hand to guide, his shield to ward, the word of God to give me speech, his heavenly host to be my guard. Christ be with me, Christ within me, Christ behind me, Christ before me, Christ beside me, Christ beneath me, Christ above me, Christ in quiet, Christ in danger. May you experience the power of Christ to overcome whatever you are up against, even the schemes of the evil one. God bless and have a great week.